Chapter 18, The Great Escape. The afternoon sun is bright from the window. He wakes, a baseball in his hand. He closes his eyes and turns over. Is it Saturday, Monday, Wednesday? His room is a mess. There are crumbs in the bed. He sleeps in his clothes. Doesn't matter. None of it matters anymore. Alex, are you awake? Some of your friends are here. Leave me alone, he says. You want to play a video game or something? Go away, he says. Maybe tomorrow, his mother says. But not tomorrow, not ever again. It doesn't matter. None of it matters anymore. The baseball rolls from his hand and thunks on the floor. A baseball thunked to the floor of the Cyclones' refurbished team bus and rolled past Alex's seat. The team was taking a ferry, not a ferry as Alex had at first thought, to a stadium at the top of a beanstalk high up in the clouds. Rather than make the long climb, most ever actors paid to have pixie dust sprinkled on them and fly up. There was a time when Alex would have been fascinated to watch out the window of a flying bus or to chat excitedly about the big game tomorrow, the last one they had to win to get to the finals. But Alex didn't care about flying buses or big games. Yesterday, after hearing what Pinocchio wanted to wish for, he'd gotten the idea to use his wish to become real. If he were real and not a daydream, it wouldn't matter if anyone believed in him. He'd be real, alive. He could go home to his parents and... And what? Share a bunk bed with the other Alex, the real Alex? That's where his fantasy about becoming real had become had come crashing down around him. There already was an Alex in the real world. There wasn't room for two. So what did it matter if he won the tournament and got a wish? There was nothing to wish for. He was a lark, the daydream of a real boy, a baseball-obsessed boy, a baseball-obsessed boy who was dying. He understood everything now. When the boy had gotten sick, he dreamed of being well, better than well. He had dreamed of being superhuman. Why? Had it made it easier being trapped in bed with the sun when the sun was shining and the sky was blue and the kids in the neighborhood were playing a pickup game the next house over? Alex had gotten better and better every game and ever after, while somewhere in the real world, the boy dreaming him had gotten worse and worse, always clinging to the hope that he would get well and become the Alex of his dreams. But now the real Alex was dying and the dream Alex was dying with him. He didn't need his visions of the real Alex to tell him that. The itch was so strong now he wanted to claw at his arms and legs and neck and chest. He wanted to tear himself apart. Dorothy leaned over the back of her seat and called everyone to attention. Who'd have thought we'd made it this far, huh guys? Everyone but Alex applauded and cheered, but Dorothy hushed them. Just two more games, but we can't start looking ahead. We have a tough team standing in our way tomorrow, the Royals. For those of you who don't know, they're really good. Really good. It's because they're, they are, is it because they're so beautiful, Jack asked? They, no, Dorothy said. It's because they play hard and they play mean. They can't be bribed either. They're incorruptible. At the mention of bribing, Toad sank miserably in his seat. Is it because they're so virtuous, Jack asked? No, it's because they already have everything anyone could ever want, Dorothy told them. Looks, brains, money, power. And Prince Charmings, she added for Jack's benefit. He blushed a shade of burnt orange. They're in this to win it, to prove they're better than everyone else, and they'll be tough to beat. Alex, my arm's better, but you're ten times the pitcher I ever was. I want you to stay on the mound, and I'll play at first again. Alex, you with us? Huh. Yeah, right. I'll play first again. No, I'll play first again. Right. Sorry. Dorothy's look lingered on him when she was back to business. All right. We're landing. Break fast first, then practice in 30 minutes, she told them, and the cyclones started gathering their things to leave the bus. Alex didn't join them. He curled up on his seat, arms wrapped around himself, and scratching, wishing he didn't have to talk to anyone. Soon there were footsteps on the bus stairs, though, and he knew he wasn't going to get his wish. I told you, Scrap said, he's got the itch. She, Dorothy, Jack, and Toad stood over him. Go away, he told them. We're not going to let you do this, old man. You've got to fight it. Why? What's the point? Most larks don't have to deal with this, Alex Scraps told him. Let us help you. You didn't let me give up, and I'm not letting you give up, Dorothy told him. If you don't get up here and practice with us, I'll have TikTok drag you out of here. Alex didn't think she'd really go through with it, but when he didn't move, Dorothy sent the machine man in. More gently than Alex thought was possible, TikTok picked him up and carried him out into the bright sunshine of the world above the clouds. The wind was stronger up here, much stronger, but TikTok was too heavy to be swayed. 
Alex felt like a baby being toted around, and as soon as he could, he wriggled free. All right, all right, I can walk. If you don't, TikTok can always carry you to the field, Dorothy told him. Alex kicked at the white fluffy clouds that covered the ground while TikTok cooked up eggs and bacon for everyone in an oven in his chest. Alex wasn't hungry. All he wanted to do was get away, go somewhere he could be alone. How could any of them understand? Storybooks lived for decades, centuries, and Dorothy was worried people wouldn't believe in her anymore. Like she had anything to worry about. She would probably live forever. She could afford to relax and enjoy herself. Not Alex. And he certainly didn't feel all rah-rah about the stupid baseball tournament when he could disappear at any moment. The Wild Woods, that's where he could go. They weren't far from here, he knew. Just down the beanstalk, they called to him, told him how easy it would be to sneak into one of the carts or trucks or buses lined up to take the ferry back down to Ever After. The Wild Woods, that's where he could get or he could hide from them. That's where he could finally be alone and die in peace. Alex slinked around the backside of the bus to run away, but Dorothy, Scraps, and Nanny Mae were waiting for him. Going somewhere, Dorothy asked. Alex bolted, kicking up clouds as he ran. Let them chase him. He was faster than any of them, even Br'er Rabbit. He was the fastest boy in the whole tournament, exactly the way the real Alex dreamed me, he realized. At least I, have, I owe him something for that. Foomp. Something hit his back and rode him to the ground. Pinkerton. Alex fought and kicked, but the flying monkey held on tight and flew him around or flew him back to where Dorothy and the others waited. Which, Alex yelled at Dorothy over the wind. You're you're wicked, all of you are. Why don't you just let me go? You don't understand. We understand well enough, old bean told told him, and we don't want to lose you. Let me go, Alex raged. You don't care about me. None of you do. You just want me for your stupid team because I'm a lark who only knows baseball. You just want to use me until I fade away. It looks as though someone will need to stand watch, Nanny Mae said. The wind came even stronger, and she put a hand to her metal hat to keep it from blowing away. Mrs. P and I, Mrs. P and I will. The wind was so strong, they all had trouble keeping their footing. Even up here in the clouds, this must have been unusual. The wind roared in, and Alec... Alex's ears and his hair whipped around his head, and he put his arms up to shield his eyes. Dorothy, being a child of the great Kansas prairies, understood the sudden dangerous change in the weather like no one else. Alex saw her perk up like she was listening to what the wind was telling her, and then she was screaming at them. Twister, we have to find shelter. The dugout is at the stadium, Nanny Mae told them. Everybody, make your way. She began, but she never got to finish. Tumbling out of the clouds came a red farm tractor, half carried out on the wind, half bouncing end over end on the ground, hurtling right for her. Nanny Mae held her hat and dove out of the way, but the tractor clipped her, knocking her back into the bus with a thud. Her body slumped lifelessly to the ground. Nanny Mae, Dorothy cried. Then, as suddenly as the wind had come, it died down again. It still lashed at their jerseys and swayed them in gusts but it wasn't sending them for cover. Nanny Mae was unconscious, but breathing, with a large dent in her helmet where she'd struck the bus. The wind, Dorothy said. If it was a tornado, it would have lasted longer. Alex tried to use the distraction to slip away again, but Pinkerton and Br'er Rabbit were there to hold him. Let me go, Alex told them. I'll disappear by tomorrow anyway, and nobody will care. Nobody, just like with Button Bright. Dorothy's eyes flared at him. Maybe we should let you go to the forest. Dorothy, Scraps scolded. Nanny Mae moaned as they took off her helmet, revealing a nasty bump on her noggin. Mrs. P paced restlessly back and forth, mewling. Oh, dear, I've been in my share of accidents, Toad told them, and that one's going to put sugar in her tank for some time. I'll stay here and watch her, and Alex, too. Toad, are you sure, Scraps asked. Oh, I know all of the tricks, for I've used them all myself. Don't worry, I won't let him get away. Toad saluted. Ever vigilant. That's my motto. They tied Alex to part of the beanstalk with some of the scraps extra fabric, and Toad was left to watch him and tend to Nanny Mae with Mrs. P while the cyclones got into a short practice. Dorothy lingered for a moment watching Alex, but he turned away. She was only pretending to be my friend to get me to play, he told himself. When he looked back, she was gone. Toad dabbed at Nanny Mae's bruised forehead with a damp cloth. I say you were rather hard on Dorothy, don't you think? Alex didn't say anything. He tried to scratch his itch without his hand and think of a way he could escape to the wild woods. Oh, 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 he moaned. What is it? 
dear boy, something wrong? Toad asked. It's my stomach. I think I need a doctor. Toad leaned against the bus and smiled. Oh, good show. Playing sick is a dandy con. Seriously, Toad, I think I might be dying. You know what helps? Hold your breath until you're red in the face and all perspiry. Dash effective, particularly if your hands are bound and you can't fake a good swoon. Alex dropped the act. You're right, Toad. I guess you can't con a con, he said, desperately trying to think of some other trick he could use. Say, I'm glad they got the old bus fixed. Toad's eyes lit up. Oh, yes. A 1939 Corsley with a Wakusha air-cooled flat twin engine, a sterling piece of engineering. How's it handle? Oh, like a dream. At least that's what I imagine. I'm not allowed to drive it. You could, you know, while everybody else is gone. I won't tell a soul. Toad rubbed his webbed hands together. Oh, oh, that's an intriguing notion. I have rather wanted to see what she can do in the hands of an expert driver. Just a little turn around the field, Alex told him. No one will ever know. Yes, yes, I, wait a moment. You're trying to trick me, make me leave you alone. Oh, ho, a fine attempt, a fine attempt indeed. But old Toad's too smart for that. You're not going to pull the ball crap down, or cap down over the amphibian's eyes, I tell you. You win, Alex said. I give up. You've got too much willpower for me. And Toad, I never said it, but thank you for sh throwing yourself at that dog when the nannies were chasing us. That was incredibly brave. Toad smiled. Anything for a friend, that's my motto. Well, since we're here with time on our hands, why not have a little after breakfast snack? Oh, quiet, quiet. I'll fetch the toast and jam. Mrs. P meowed at Toad. Oh, don't worry. I'm sure I can rustle up a bit of fish for you. Mrs. P kept meowing at Toad. When he didn't understand, she meowed at Nanny May, trying to wake her up. I'll get the picnic blanket and plates, Alex said. He turned his bound, bound hands towards Toad, if you would. Of course, of course, Toad said. He untied Alex's hands and Mrs. P meowed louder and more insistently. Now, now, my dear cat, no need to be so pushy. I'll just pop around to get things, or get the fixings. Toad disappeared around the corner, around the other side of the pink bus, humming happily to himself. Mrs. P growled at Alex, low and angry. Nanny Mae still unconscious by her side. Yeah, well, just try and stop me, Alex said, and he took off for, took off for the ferry. Toad tried it back a few minutes later with an armful of groceries, humming a little song about himself. His eyes fell on the empty ground where Alex should have been, and he dropped the food, realizing his mistake. Oh, poop.